This week's subscriber request video is going to cover these 11 stocks. Albemarle, Alibaba, Fabernet, LPL Financial, 3M, Planeteer, Roche, Charles Schwab, Snowflake, Tencent Holdings, and Trade Desk. Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. Doing things a little bit differently this week. I'm going to be doing the subscriber request video today on Tuesday. I usually do a, a video where we've kind of vetted a company and did some you know, serious research. We're a little behind on that this week, so we'll be postponing that. I'll be posting that probably Wednesday or Thursday. But what I did do, I did take a look at the, the 11 subscriber requests from our last video. And what's interesting about this, these particular requests, these are not companies that, other than with the exception of one, that I'm, you know, really familiar with or currently researching. So this video is going to be kind of fun because I'm going to be able to take a look at these video or these companies through the lens of the FastGraphs Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, just from a fresh look, if you will, stocks that I'm not really familiar with. And so I'll be able to illustrate how I would evaluate what I see based on what the FastGrass Fundamental Analyzer software tool is telling me. And remember, you know, known as Mr. Valuation, I'm always looking for good value. Uh, but I'm also looking for good businesses that are at good value. And so that'll become important. I'm going to have a little fun. One of the stocks here, Fabronet, was a video that I did in 2017 when we were first launching our channel and one of the subscribers asked me to revisit that. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with that one. But anyway, let's go ahead and get into the video here. I'm going to do them in alphabetical order because that's the simplest. And let's take a look at what I see as I go through these 11 companies through the lens of the FastGraphs Fundamentals Analyzer Research Tool. But before I get started, I always want to make this first you know, admonition here. FastGraphs is a research tool. It's a tool to think with. It doesn't dictate to you, it reveals things to you. As you change time frames, you get different growth rates. It's an analytical tool, and you have to use it as an analytical tool. Run different variations, run different metrics, and you know, analyze what you're seeing from the company because you know, success leaves clues, and the history of a company is extremely important. It gives you a lot of insight into what kind of company it is, how well it's managed, what its business you know, results are have been in the past and therefore perhaps what, you know, they might give you some indication of what they might be in the future. Not in precise numbers, but in, in terms of trends and things like that. So let's go ahead and get into these 11 companies. And let's start with Albemarle, which is one of the largest lithium producers in the country. And this is a very, very interesting graph because what I want you to see here is that Albemarle had this 444% increase in earnings from fiscal year December 21 to 2022. And you see this huge surge in earnings. Now, you know, if I, if I, you know, call that out, you can see that this has been an eight and a half percent grower prior to that. And the company, you know, was really a company whose stock price followed its earnings very consistently. And like, you know, obviously the market gets inefficient at times. And there were times when it went on sale and it got very cheap. And there were times when it got very, very expensive relative to its growth. But then, you know, coming out of COVID and the down year, we ended up having this huge surge in price, which preceded this huge surge in operating earnings. Now, I took the liberty of going into Yahoo Finance and I asked the simple question, why did their sales increase so dramatically in 2022? And as you can see, net sales had an increase of 193%. And this was for the fourth quarter of, of 2022. Adjusted EBITDA had an increase of 444%. And what they attribute most of this to, you know, in the article here in Yahoo Finance, and I think this is actually from the company's own press release, was the fact that lithium prices went up dramatically, and so did their capacity. They brought a lot of things on capacity. So what we have here with Albemarle is this aberrant surge, and now we're going to move to more of a growth rate. So when I'm using the FastGraphs tool here, I'm obviously not going to 
you know, figure a 16% growth rate is going to be the norm because what I saw when I scrolled this out here, when I, you know, took this aberrant off, this has normally been about an 8 or 9% growth. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go in the forecasting calculator, and what I see here is analysts expect this to grow at about 7%, but they do expect it to go from the 440% growth down to a 30% growth. So we are expecting a good year this year and then kind of a flat growth in 2024 and a negative growth rate from these numbers. But this is more adjusting to what I would call more normalcy from what, you know, why I would say the long-term growth rate for this company is expected to be about 18% a year though. So the stock looks very cheap on that basis. You know, we obviously know that electric vehicles that use the lithium batteries and lithium energy and, uh, you know, batteries, generally are kind of a hot commodity. So we are getting excessive growth in what we, what historical norms would show, and you'd want to take that into consideration. And this company is also making acquisitions and increasing the capacity. And, you know, there are a lot of things to research and discover about this company going forward. But I would argue that if you're looking at forecasting here from a, you know, normal standpoint, buying this stock at a blended PE of eight is probably you know very attractive with an earnings yield of 12 11.95 percent and a modest dividend yield this is not a dividend payer it has paid a dividend historically you know the dividend record has been you know consistent and it has actually grown over the years but it's kind of the growth has kind of slowed down a little let's look at performance real quick you can see that the growth rate of the dividend in recent years has been rather meager, even though the explosive growth of the earnings. And what that tells me is the company is looking for ways to, you know, reinvest in their business. The lithium business is probably going through a dynamic change now, you know, with lithium prices up, demand up, and everything else. And they're forecasting an 18% growth rate going forward. These are all things you'd want to take into consideration. But this is primarily, I would say, a capital appreciation story based on the fact that the valuation relative not to this historical growth here, but relative to future growth looks very attractive here as a, you know, a stock that is capable of going back to a 14 or 15 multiple from an eight multiple. So really it's PE ratio expansion that I think is going to bring most of the return. You know, if you go out here, you're looking at a 29% annualized rate of return, including dividends, but that's even considering a negative year here. So all in all, I like this company. You know, I think one of the real strong stories here are looking at the company from, you know, sales looked like they're going to be continue to be strong, but we did have this huge increase in sales. We also had huge increases in cash flows. So across the board, the fundamentals of this company changed dynamically in 2022, but they're now moving back into something a little more normal or maybe above average compared to what they historically have. And again, I think you should, you know, take all of that into consideration. The next stock I want to look at is Alibaba, the um, you know Chinese. Like what is? I guess this is Amazon again. I'm not real familiar with this company, but I do find the fast graph very interesting here to analyze. The one thing I want you to notice, and again, using the features of the tool, this is an analytical tool. If I go back, you know, to even through COVID, this company grew very fast, and it had just an enormous growth rate. Now, once again, when I look at this thing, I see a 3.1,000% growth rate from 2014. I've got to take that, you know, off of the graph. That's not really a practical number. So here I've got 20% growth, but I did have a slowdown in growth in 2021. And then it's expected to start growing again at about, you know, 10 or 12%. So as I look at this stock, if I shorten this time frame to the last four or five years, I get a growth rate of about 5.61% going forward. This is what I think is a rational expectation for Alibaba going forward. If I go to the forecasting calculators here and look at, you know, there's an enormous amount of analysts that are giving me forecasts for 2024, which, by the way, their fiscal year ends in March. So, you know, their March 23 was their last fiscal year, and they had a minus 6% growth, but they are expected 10% growth by 47 analysts this year, 41 analysts in 2025. But then it drops down to only two analysts, so we don't have, you know, I would put most of my impetus on 
what the consensus of this large group of analysts is thinking for the company. And it gives you a nice 19 or 20 percent rate of return, no dividend. And, you know, if I look at the analyst scorecard of this company, I do want you to notice that it's had really an, an impeccable scorecard except for 2022. That's where we had a little bit of trouble. So, you know, perhaps the analysts are back on track and getting it right. I think this company is a 5 or 6 percent grower going forward. Historically, it grew much faster than that. But, you know, the recent growth rates expected to be 10, 12, and 7, and averaging maybe 5 or 6 percent. When you look at it from that perspective, you know, the stock looks modestly undervalued, but not as undervalued as you get the impression looking at the forecasting graph. A lot of political risk in this company, you know, so that's something to take into consideration as you're you're looking at it. But anyway, that's Alibaba. The next one on the list is one that I found very interesting. It's Fabrinet. Now, Fabrinet is a company that I originally produced an article on back in 2017. I think it was actually July 31st. And this is about two days before that. And, you know, I've produced a video. I'm going to provide you a link to the video. This was that video I did. It's only about three and a half minutes long. So it's kind of a quick video you can look at. It was just, I called it a fabulous growth stock you've never heard of. I wasn't familiar with the company, but it did look attractive at that point of view. So you can, you know, go and look at that video if you would like. What's interesting is the earnings did not come out as expected for the first year, but then they did grow pretty nicely going forward. So we had this drop. Now, notice how the price has correlated with the earnings. Notice how the market gets inefficient at times and overprices it. And, you know, then we had this correction, reversion back to the mean, got overpriced again, and now we're back to the mean. It looks modestly undervalued here. What's interesting is if you run a performance calculation from this date to its current valuation, even though it's fallen dramatically from its high, you know, in, say, December of 2022, you still had a 15.9% you know, average rate of return, and that's with no dividends. But I also want to point out that if you look at a stock like this, and I missed that, but that's close enough. If you measured at this peaks during that time frame, you'd have had almost a 22% growth rate. Now, the story I want to tell here is that valuation matters, and it matters a lot. If you'd have been fortunate enough to buy it, you know, closer to bottoming out, in, you know, and this, by the way, has a June fiscal year, then your rate of return out to that peak would have been over 42%. This is why I harp on valuation so much. You see a company here that's gone through these valuation, you know, anomalies here where it gets overvalued and comes back to the mean. You know, you see it doing that many times. But let's not get, you know, let's not pick perfect bottom. Let's say that you bought the stock after it had dropped, you know, rather precipitously from its high of 45 and you bought it at 36 and held it even to today's low valuation. You make 21% a year, which is better than what it would have been if you'd have bought it the day I produced the video. So valuation is going to have such an impact on performance over time. But I thought this would be fun to take a look at. You know, all in all, this stock has done extremely well since um, this is close enough. Since I originally wrote the video, as you can see, it, the price followed earnings. But in the meantime, the price is a lot more nervous than the earnings themselves. The next stock we want to look at is LPL Financial. This is an interesting stock. It has a pretty good growth history. You can see it had a weak period here, you know, from 2011 through about 2016. I want you to notice the stock price kind of flatlined here. It generated about a 1% rate of return. But then from here, it kind of got its mojo and the growth rate, you know, changed dramatically. And now we ended up with a 33% rate of return. I want you to see that specifically here that the growth accelerated over 28% a year. And I can even knock another year off of that. And that gets it up to, you know, 28 and three quarters percent. So that growth has a great deal to do with what the performance, the stock was reasonably valued, if not moderately undervalued, based on that 28% growth rate here. And so you still ended up getting a 30% rate of return, including dividends, even though you had, you know, you went from a PE of 17.8 to 14.9. Growth can really overcome a lot of mistakes and a lot of, you know, issues, valuation issues. Like I've often said, you can't really overpay for a very fast growing company and lose money. You might not make what you deserve, but, you know, ultimately you won't lose money by doing that. Growth is important and you can see that with LPL Financial. I think the stock looks moderately undervalued here. The market 
as applied, you know, a, a moderate PE. If I look at forecasting, it's expected to grow at 15%. That would make it, you know, currently fairly valued and give you a nice um, double digit rate of return, including the modest dividend that they pay, which is less than 1%. Um, if you went to the normal multiple, which has been about 17, that numbers are a little bit better. So somewhere between a 15 and say 18 multiple, this stock probably looks attractive, but it's not doesn't have a high margin of safety. I want to point that out. But it is interesting at these prices. So that's my take on LPL. 3M is one that I do own that I did cover. This is one of the exceptions. I think 3M, you know, went through some issues. Some of those issues have been resolved. You know, the one was the military hearing aids. The company, you know, fell dramatically. You can see the market has had a penchant for applying a what I call a quality premium valuation on this stock. Historically, it's an A-rated stock with less than 50% debt. The company has gone through a little bit of earnings issues, but it has had modest cyclicality in the past. But clearly, this may be as good a time to buy the stock. Had you bought the stock at its bottom in you know March 6th of 2009, coming out of the Great Recession, and held it to even today's undervaluation, you'd have still made 10% a year. But once again, the importance of valuation, if you bought it and held it to where it peaked out, where it got really expensive, you know, back in 2018 here, you would have made 23 or 24% a year on your money. So valuation matters and it matters a lot. I believe this stock is extremely attractive now. It offers almost a 6% dividend yield. It has a very good long history of increasing its dividend. The growth rate's been slowing down a little bit recently, but I think this is a good time from a valuation perspective, especially for those of you looking for income to build, start building a position in 3M. I own the stock, I'm long the stock, and I'm very happy with my position. The next stock on the list would be Pelantir. This is one I'm not real familiar with. It's an application software company, but here's something that I think is important that Fast Graphs really reveals instantaneous to those who know how to use the tool. The stock came out with a lot of hype and hysteria. You know, it went public in um, January of 2021. Like a lot of IPOs, you know, we had this huge uptick in price went from 122 to 187 for a high. That was, you know, very exciting. But then I want you to notice it's been a free fall ever since because earnings, they did earn some money in 2021, but that fell over 50% in 2022. That led to this large drop in value. Now the stock is expected to have good earnings growth next year and then, you know, about 20%. So if we're looking at it from a forecasting point of view, the company is expected to grow at around 24 or 25% a year. And that's, you know, the long-term forecast is even higher. But the point I want to make here is that you're looking at a stock that is currently trading at an 85 multiple. That means if the company paid you all of the profits that they made and you got them all as in, in the form of a dividend, you'd only get 1% return on your money if they made all the profits. And that just indicates that the stock is still overvalued even after it has fallen this much. If you look at performance since the IPO, if you will, it's had a negative 36% growth. It's turned $10,000, you know, original investment into 3,500. Yet it's had, you know, pretty decent results going forward. Now, what makes stocks like these attractive to a lot of people is when you look at them from the perspective of sales. This company has grown very, very fast from a sales point of view. And again, you see the, you know, the huge surge in price with sales growth. It was really strong. But then, you know, obviously the rubber meets the road. The company has not been able to turn these sales into large profits and therefore the stock price has fallen. I think the stock is still expensive, but I do think if you're able to buy the stock, you know, maybe 50% below what it's currently trading at now, we can calculate that. I'd say somewhere maybe at 60% below what it's trading at now, it might become a good buy. But as a value investor and as Mr. Valuation, I wouldn't be an interested in that stock until the PE got down to somewhere around, you know, 15 or maybe even 20 times earnings. I just think it's very expensive now. The next stock on the list would be Roche. Now, you know, Roche, we know, is a pharmaceutical company. It's one of the bigger healthcare companies. It's AA rated. 
you know, headquartered in Switzerland. It's got a little bit of cyclicality. I don't know if these are special dividends or what, but the dividend record's a little spotty. Now, this is in U.S. dollars, so there could also be some currency conversion that is skewing this chart a little bit. Now, all this means here, by the way, for those of you who are subscribers, that no analysts are willing to forecast a dividend going forward. So, you know, the dividend of about 70 you know, five to 80 cents is maybe what you might want to expect going forward. I don't know that to be true, but that's just what the graph is telling me, or in this case, not telling me. From an operating cash flow point of view, they're going to have plenty of cash. They are expected to have plenty of cash to be able to issue a dividend. So I would just say Roche probably looks attractively valued here based on cash flows or earnings. You know, it's got a modest margin of safety, but not a very large margin of safety. It did get pretty inexpensive about, you know, in March and it's, you know, recovered pretty nicely since then. But anyway, Roche is one that, you know, you were asked to look at and that's my take on Roche. Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab got into what I would call negative sympathy with the banking scandals that went on, you know, the you know the bank in California and the others. And so we had this big drop. But banking is a very small part of this company's business. It's primarily brokerage. You can see it had a pretty strong rally. Yesterday it was up f almost 5%. I think this stock is incredibly cheap. It's an A-rated stock with less than 28% debt. And I think you can buy it now with a blended P of 13, earnings yield of 7.4%, and a dividend yield approaching 2%. If you're ever going to take a position in Schwab, other than maybe during the COVID years, or even if you wanted to go you know, back a little further, you know, you could have taken a position coming out of the Great Recession, but it never even got cheap during that, even though it had some earnings drops. But anyway, right now, I think Schwab is extremely inexpensive. I think the stock looks very promising going forward. This is one I'm currently researching for the total return portfolios I run. If you look at it from a standpoint of a 15 PE, it offers about an 18% return. If you look at it from a standpoint of a normal 21 to 22 PE, it could offer up to 34%. So like I say, this could be a really good time to be starting a position in Schwab, in Charles Schwab and Company. Valuation starting to look very, very attractive. The next company is Snowflake Internet Services and Infrastructure. Again, interesting stock to look at from the standpoint of the fundamentals. Now, the first thing you got to do is, again, if you're a subscriber to FastGraph, the normal PE has been ridiculous. Okay, so, you know, it's mathematically correct, but just take it off. It doesn't, it doesn't work, you know, because if you notice, if I use my scrolling mouse here, I'm showing no PEs here because there was no E, there was no earning. Now, once I started to get earnings, you know, I started having 8,000 times earnings and, you know, 4,700 times earnings and 1,300 times earnings, currently trading at 473 times earnings. Now, once again, with these hot young companies, I believe the revenue line, you know, really gets into people's heads and gets them interested in the stock. But again, once again, the company's generated no profit to speak of. And consequently, the stock price came out and had a you know, big drop initially. We had a big strong rally in 2021, fiscal year January. Even though it's fallen dramatically since then, all throughout 2022, and it's kind of flatlined in 2023, I believe this stock is still expensive. This might be a stock to look at for growth going forward. Again, if you could buy it a lot cheaper than it's currently trading at, even with a 52% forecast long-term growth rate, but there's only two analysts making that forecast. I think the stock still looks extremely expensive and an 8,000 PE ratio is simply ludicrous. You know, no stock is going to maintain that. When growth rates are high, like 30%, we, we actually use P equals growth rate, but we cap it out at a 30 multiple. We consider that about as high a multiple as you should ever pay for a stock. And Snowflake, again, looks very, very expensive you know, generating potential losses for the next two or three years. I'd avoid this one. Tencent Holdings, you know, another Chinese company here. They must have paid a special dividend here. I don't follow the stock, but they did go from an 18 cent dividend to $1.47. We can go into the performance report here. And we can go ahead and push the dividends out. And they did in fiscal year 2022, they did pay a $1.49 dividend on their last quarter. So they did pay a, a you know a real big dividend there in 2023. They're paying, they're paying 21 cents. Their dividend increased dramatically that one year. They did have a surge in earnings, but then they've had a kind of a weakness, it looks like, in 2022. From a standpoint of operating cash flow, dividend looks very well covered. From a standpoint of sales, 
The company looks a lot more benign. Sales did drop in 2022, but they dropped only modestly. But obviously, there are some things must have happened. I've had a look at diluted earnings and, you know, which are gap and versus operating earnings. We get a very similar picture. They had a large drop in earnings there, and that caused, of course, the stock price to collapse. But the recovery has been good. The stock, if I'm looking at it forward looking, I'd say it's a little expensive today with, with about a 20 percent you know, growth rate and a blended P.E. of 27 Earnings yield of only 3.7%. I would have probably been more in favor of buying the stock when the PE got down here below 15. I do consider it a little bit expensive again now, but it would be one that you might want to watch because, you know, a weak market and you could end up getting it at a decent price going forward. Trade desk, another one I'm not familiar with, but it's obviously a fundamentally, you know, if I take the price off of this graph, you know, and look at the stock from a standpoint of fundamental growth, Operating earnings growth has been very consistent. It's been very stellar. It's averaged over 40% growth. If I look at it from the standpoint of some of the other important metrics, if I look at it from the standpoint of operating cash flow, been a little bit you know, more cyclical, but still very strong growth. If I shorten that to where I just get rid of some of that, it's you know about 40% growth in cash flow as well. If I look at it from a sales point of view, it's had very consistent and very strong growth. So I like this stock. As a business, it looks like a very interesting business. What I don't like is the fact that it's been trading at a premium valuation. And you can see how high valuation really killed investors' chances of making any money on this stock over the last two or three years. You had a negative rate of return, even though the company had very strong growth rate. Valuation matters, and it matters a lot. And you know, right now, I still think the stock at a 57 P.E., is too expensive, even considering the good future that it has. Long term, you might make money in a stock if you held it 10 years from now and it continued to do well. But that's, you know, that's wishing for an awful lot. Uh, anyway, those are the 11 stocks that you guys asked to see. Um, this has been Chuck Carnival, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. Hope you enjoyed this subscriber request video. Had a little bit of fun here because you showed me some stocks that I haven't been looking at. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed my take and perspective on them. And I hope perhaps you maybe learned a little bit about how to use the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, Fast Graphs a little more effectively now. It's an analytical tool to think with. Don't just look at the graph and make a decision. Manipulate you know, the data, the time frames. And by the way, more near-term time frames to me are always more important than long-term historical time frames. But you can learn a great deal from the past, so don't discount it totally. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel. I want to thank you. We're you know, over 90,000 subscribers to the channel now. It's been growing. We really appreciate that. I'm going to tr continue to try to do these subscriber request videos. But, you know, try to keep it reasonable. You know, I, there's only so many companies I can cover in one video. Hope you enjoyed this. I'll be doing my featured stock of the week video um, either tomorrow or Wednesday or Thursday of this week. We're working on it now. We're in the late stages of getting it finished. So I'll be talking to you again then. Thanks for watching.